And hello, my fabulous students. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I'm excited to be with you today. Today is River Valley Civilization. So we went from hunting, gathering. We talked about the Neolithic Revolution and how we went from nomadic lifestyle to sedentary lifestyle. What does that all mean? How does that play into civilizations? That's what we're going to discuss today. And just to let you know, we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to mention briefly the six civilizations, and we're going to focus mostly on Egypt, Mesopotamia, and a little bit of the Harappan slash uh, Indo-Aryan civilization. Um, your readings are so critical at this point because there's just no way I can get through all the information. We are covering, as you can see, a lot of time here, around 4,000 BCE to 600 BCE. Uh, and I have to only cover it in one webcast. So, got to do those readings, people. And here we go. Let us begin. So, there are six river valley civilizations. You got Mesopotamia, and the rivers that allowed it to form were the Tigris and the Euphrates. You have Egypt, which is formed off the Nile. You have uh, Mohenjo Daro and Harappan civilization, which is by the Indus River Valley. You got the Shang, which is by the Yellow River, or also known as the Huanghe Valley, the Olmecs in Mesoamerica, the Chavin, and the Andean South American region. So, we have uh, China. We have the Harappa near India here. We have Mesopotamia. We have Egypt, Olmec, and the Chavin. So we have uh, states or governments starting to emerge. Leaders uh, emerge to manage surplus. So we have lots of surpluses that are being formed due to amazing innovations in technology like the plow, irrigation, where they discovered how if they built uh, ditches and canals, they could bring water to the plants rather than bring, you bringing water to the plants yourself, which would be a lot of time and effort. And so a lot of these innovations that are being created are starting to give us surplus. When enough surplus happens, there's usually a, somebody or some buddies that stand up and say, I know what we should do with this. And people usually, if they have enough charisma, people will follow them. So these leaders are typically uh, would claim divine right in some way. They would kind of connect themselves to the gods. The Egyptians were good at this. So were the, uh, the Mesopotamians. The region of Mesopotamia and Egypt were the first to emerge. Early regions of state and expansion uh, or empire building were Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and the uh, Nile Valley. So here we have Sumer, which is the first civilization to emerge. And then north we have Babylon, which is right around here. And then over here we have Egypt. So we have advanced uh, weapons and technology. We have the composite bow. The composite bow is different because uh, the regular bow was just made of like a stick or wood and they had some kind of a fabric or string that they could uh, fasten to it. The composite bow was actually, it was, it was more than one material. You know, it's like bone, wood, animal sinew, and they bind and intertwine them together. So there's a little more give when you pull back and it's not going to break because it's reinforced with a bunch of materials to uh, to allow it to stay strong. And so that was important because it made the bow smaller and it also allowed arrows to be flung much further than with the regular bow. Another one is iron weapons. So iron comes about around Turkey. It's also known as the Hittite civilization. And they figure out how to do reinforced iron weapons, which uh, if you have an iron weapon versus a bronze weapon, you're, the iron's going to cut through the bronze. So uh, civilizations that have the more superior technology, they usually win those battles. Not always, but they have a, a definitely a, an advantage. And then in transportation, we have horseback riding, which emerges in Central Asia. And then we have chariots, which, uh, which start spreading throughout the area. And the Indo-Aryans were very popular. Also, the Hittites were also known for their chariots. 
So culture is also developing. We have these amazing edifices uh, emerging. We got ziggurats in Mesopotamia. This is a picture of a ziggurat. Look how beautiful it is. It's also known sometimes as a step pyramid. And uh, ziggurats at the very top, this area right here, this is the temple. So you have this beautiful edifice and then you have the temple. And many, many cultures believe that temples were like a, a way to ascend into a higher realm. And some people would actually go up mountains to try to get to that higher realm. But people here would build ziggurats and put a temple. And ziggurat would represent like a mountain. The temple would represent the sanctuary of, of the gods or God or what have you. And then we have beautiful pyramids that the Egyptians uh, crafted, which are probably a little more... Uh, well, are a lot more complex than a ziggurat because of the the uh, the the uh, smooth sides of the pyramid, and then of course we have temples which are also being built during that time. We have urban planning beginning, so we have people because we have governments now we have planning and organization. People are building defensive walls. People are starting to build streets and roads. Okay, Mesopotamia had plenty of these, Egypt as well. Uh, and then we have sewage systems, water systems. Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa were known for this, where they actually had a sewage drain, uh, outdoor toilets, and things like that to stay sanitary and clean. Artistic culture also begins. We got beautiful sculptures. Look at this Egyptian sculpture. Look at this little tiny person. Look at these massive edifices that they've created. Next, we have wall decorations and we have paintings. And so Egypt is going to explode in, uh, in culture, um, especially when it comes to sculptors, paintings, wall decoratings, etc. We have writing, which begins to emerge as well. So the very first writing system emerged in Sumeria, and it's known as cuneiform. Right here, cuneiform. And what that means is, uh, well, cuneiform simply means wedge-shaped. So they're writing on clay. And if you've ever written on clay, you probably don't want to sign your name. Clay isn't very forgiving because there's resistance. And so what these people did is they realized, look, we need to, <laughs> when we write, we need to figure out a system where we just write in straight lines. Because if we're going to try and curve a line, uh, it just doesn't work well in clay. So they created these wedge shapes. And when you combine these wedge shapes together, like you see here, they mean something. And so all this here is cuneiform, which is they're actually writing something. And it has meaning if you can read it, which many of my professors did at UCLA. Okay, we have uh, hieroglyphics which are the Egyptian form of writing. So we talked about cuneiform, which is Sumerian, hieroglyphics, Egyptian, and then pictographs are the kind of the beginning emerging of, uh, of the Chinese civilization that will eventually lead to their writing system as well. So we have here, this was a sun, then they changed it, then they changed it again. This would be a, a Chinese character for the sun. So slowly, as you can see, the, the metamorphosis from pictographs, which are on the left, to kind of an in-between, and then finally they emerge into a Chinese character. Okay? Law and order begins. So with, with urbanization happening and leaders emerging, they're trying to figure out how can we keep things safe and orderly. The last thing a leader wants is chaos. So... What they did is, well, Hammurabi was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first, to actually create what's called a code of laws that was displayed in public for everybody to see. And so people could go up and they could see their, their, rule, their, um, their rights. And there's over 280 laws that were created. Here's the top of the stele. And then if you see all these scratch marks, those are actually writings. That's cuneiform. And down here, you can see how far it goes. It goes from about here to here. This is the stele. I think it's about 13 feet high. And, uh, and then if you look really close, you can see what it actually looks like. And so uh, many people had rights if you were a citizen. If you weren't a citizen, then your rights 
you had less rights or no rights. And more unfortunately, if you were a slave, you had no rights because you weren't considered a person. You were considered property of a person. Religions with lasting influence. We have the Vedic religions. The Vedic religions are come from the Indo-Aryans. The Indo-Aryans kind of come down into the Indian uh, Valley near the Ganges River, and they merge with the remnant of the of the uh, Harappan people after Harappa uh, is is uh, collapses, and they kind of merge into something. Uh, into what we know now know as the Indian culture today. Uh, Aryans brought Vedic texts, which were written in Sanskrit. And uh, this is kind of the basis of their religion here. And then we have the Hebrew monotheism. And uh, so the Jewish people trace origins of the race all the way back to Abraham, who was called by God to leave Mesopotamia and settle in the land of Canaan or Canaan, around 2000 BCE. Later prophets, such as Moses, played an influential role in the development of Hebrew monotheism. And then another monotheistic religion, which isn't too popular because it's not really around today, it's known as Zoroastrianism. And uh, so we have Zoroaster, which was a prophet in Persia, or modern-day Iran, and he also preached that there was a, a one god. His name was Ahura Mazda, and that uh, Ahura Mazda was kind of the good god, and there was another god trying to destroy things, and there was this whole balance between good and evil. Um, so Zoroastrianism is also a, a lasting religion that will affect the next, uh, you know, probably in the next uh, 800 years after this, after 600 years. So the, uh, the the Persian Empire will, when they emerge with Cyrus the Great, will 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 incorporate this Zoroastrianism. And then we have regional and trans-regional trade. Basically, trans-regional means one region trades with another region way over here. So we have Mesopotamia in the red here. And then we have the Indus uh, River, uh, Harappa. And they actually traded. We have evidence that they did trade with each other. We also have evidence that the Mesopotamians and, uh, and the Egyptians traded with each other. And then we have evidence that the Egyptians, right here in the purple, and then down south to them would be Nubia or the, the kingdom of Cush, and, uh, and that they actually traded with one another as well. So we have regional and trans-regional trading happening between these river valley civilizations. And then there's a social uh, hierarchy of some kind. This is the Sumerian. This is called the Ur Standard. And uh, as you look at the bottom here, you have lots of uh, laborers, possibly slaves, farmers. In the second rung here, we have um, people who probably look a little better off than these people. These are merchants, artisans, uh, business people, and they would be kind of like in the middle class. And then the upper class, you got you know the wealthy, you got um, priests, you got uh, government administrators. And then if you look at the top, Look to see who is probably the most important person there. And if you look at this guy who is way taller, well, I shouldn't say way, but he is taller, significantly taller than everybody else, nearly ahead, okay? This is obviously the person who's in charge. And he is a king slash priest. Um, again, the, the Sumerians, they merged leadership and religion. And going on to Egypt... We have the pharaoh, of course, at the top. The pharaoh also merged leadership and religion. He would call himself the son of Re or Ra. So people believe that he was actually the son of a god. But at the bottom, we have unskilled workers. Okay, usually these are known as slaves. We have farmers and herders, artisans, shopkeepers, scribes, priests, nobles, and then we have pharaohs. So we have social classes that are emerging within these complex uh, structures, which we know as civilization. And then we have, um, finally, we have literature that's starting to emerge. Literature means you have to have a pretty good complex writing system. The Epic of Gilgamesh is probably the greatest and oldest uh, epic ever to be written. It's a Sumerian 
slash Babylonian epic. It's about a, a, a very strong king named Gilgamesh and uh, he his adventures and eventually he starts questioning his own mortality and looks for immortality. And uh, anyway, it's 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 an enthralling. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's 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 a uh, it's quite interesting to see the kind of things that the Mesopotamian people were concerning themselves with in this epic. We have the Rig Veda. Rig Veda is also a very important part to the Indian slash Indo-Aryan uh, culture. And then within the Rig Veda, they talk about the, uh, the three gods. You have Brahman in the middle. I believe Shiva is on the left. And then Vishnu is on the right. And then you have the Book of the Dead, which is um, kind of the, the Egyptian afterlife. It explains what happens to Egyptians uh, after they die. And uh, it also gives them spells and incantations to sort of help them pass to the afterlife after they die to eventually be uh, weighed by Anubis here and then eventually to go on to the rest of Osiris. So that's pretty much it. Go ahead and write your one-page uh, summary, and I look forward to talking to you about this. Thank you.